Who has had the opportunity to use their ultrasonic yet already? Anybody? Oh, Nicole said she did. Okay. <laughs> there is, um, we teach it to de-plaque and we used to introduce it at the very first semester because the philosophy of the ultrasonic is to go in and remove and disrupt bacteria subgingively. So we want to do that on all of our patients, healthy or not. But with the aerosols and with COVID-19, we are stepping back now and um, teaching it like we used to, where for the ultrasonic, um, you are allowed to use it on difficulty threes and difficulty fours and do hand instrumentation for everything else. That's not to say that you can't use the ultrasonic if you don't have a difficulty three, it's by special permission from your faculty. So if somebody has a really nice bridge of calculus on the mandibular anteriors, that might be a great way to learn what the ultrasonic can do and not do. So don't be afraid to ask as well if you can use the ultrasonic in specific areas of the mouth. Um, also, don't be afraid to, um, if you don't agree with an assessment as far as a difficulty level, you have the right to ask for a second opinion, be it by the same instructor or by a different instructor, but it has to be on the first quadrant that you are scaling. So let's say I classified somebody as a difficulty two and you're getting in there because you know we, we get in very quickly to assume this and you're finding that the calculus is more than what was anticipated or more tenacious than what was anticipated. That first quadrant, you can have whoever that um, instructor is that's working with you to do another evaluation on that quadrant to see if it can in fact be bumped up. We don't bump down. So if I sit down with your, with your patient and going, really? Difficulty three, really? Uh, I might say, well, consider this as a gift. Okay, and you'll get your three points. Uh, but we can always make them more difficult, but again, in the first quadrant. So you can't be on your third quadrant and say, um, this is taking longer, it's more difficult. Can you reeval? Because it's taken me six appointments and I'm only on my third quadrant. Does that make sense? We don't take it personally because we, again, our job is to, to uh, try and evaluate as quickly as possible and not hold you up. And sometimes we hold you up, as you know. All right. So let's move on. Ultrasonic and sonic instrumentation. These are questions that, uh, that are also on the board exam. So you will be revisiting this information prior to you taking the boards. These second year students are busy studying for that. Right now, a lot of the students will take their boards um, during spring break. So we've got a lot of, um, of panic going on right now. But electronically powered instrumentation, all right? That's what we are using, electronically powered instrumentation. Um, uses rapid energy vibrations of a powered instrument tip to fracture calculus deposits from the tooth surface and to clean the environment of the periodontal pocket to clean the environment of the periodontal pocket. When I was a student, all we were doing was using the ultrasonic to remove calculus. We didn't know about periodebridement and all the bugs that lived under there and that type of thing. So um, we've come a long way in the past 40 years on the technology and the benefits 
of using certain technologies. So it's fracturing the deposits and cleaning the environment of the periodontal pocket. This is a standard universal tip. You can see the water coming out. You can see how thick that tip is compared to where you're trying to get. So an ultrasonic instrument, depending on the insert that you're using, is going to be able to reach areas or not reach areas. And this is really um, dependent on your technique, just as your hand instrumentation is. Some of us will be better than others. And we get better as we go along. It uses something called cavitation and you can see these bubbles. What would bubbles do? Do you think it would be a good thing or a bad thing underneath tissue? Is it like aerating it? Like it's aerating it. It's, it's yes, it's effervescing. It's allowing things to be disrupted and, um, and come out of the pocket. You're bringing air underneath the pocket. You are bringing these bubbles, which uh, we're going to get into, which actually uh, implode the bacteria. So it's, uh, it's, it's harmful to the bacteria, the power and the bubbles. And it's a way to bring medicaments, chemicals underneath the pocket area. So you could be using the ultrasonic with special bottles that bring a fluid with chemicals, bactericidal fluid underneath the gum tissue. So you're irrigating while you are using the power tip. Now, power, electricity, power, energy, energy is waves, energy produces heat. So we need a way to cool that instrument. And with the ultrasonic, uh, it is an electrically powered device and our coolant is water. The more water, the better. Sometimes too little water will heat up that instrument. The water then gets very hot. The tip gets hot and it's uncomfortable for the patient and it's uncomfortable for you, the clinician, to hold on to the insert. So research investigations indicate that electronically powered devices are not only as effective as hand instrumentation, but also have some advantages over hand instrumentation. So they've got the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's not, um, it, <clears throat> it's, it doesn't, um, it, it's not a blanket statement that they are better. Again, a lot of this is user dependent as well. So we know it removes calculus. Now the ultrasonic was really devised as a cutting tool. So the dentists were using it to remove tooth structure and remove um, caries as well as tooth structure and root structure. So powered instrumentation is as effective as hand instrumentation in removing calculus deposits. Now, having said that, we all have the ability to burnish calculus. If we were using an instrument uh, and not ang hand instrument and not angling it properly for calculus removal or using an instrument that is dull, we have the capability of burnishing that calculus, making it smooth instead of removing it. And we can do that with the ultrasonic as well. So uh, it, it does not necessarily mean that it is better. We can still burnish with both manual and ultrasonic. So powered instruments are especially effective in disrupting the subgingival plaque biofilm from root surfaces and from the pocket space. That is the advantage over hand instrumentation. Because you've got this water spray and the bubbles coming out, it really does a nice job for that loosely adherent 
bacteria. The inserts can be of various size and diameter, so you can get into tight spaces better than your manual instruments. Used with proper technique. Now that again, proper technique. Electronically powered instruments on low or medium power settings seem to do less damage to the root surface than hand instrumentation. Hand instrumentation, we can gouge the cementum, we can remove cementum, but guess what? We can do the same thing with our powered instruments. So low to medium power settings, that's the same thing as lightening your touch and not really doing a heavy handed scaling with your manual instruments. You have slim diameter instruments that are actually slimmer than um, your manual instruments. Some of them are about the diameter as your probe that can get into uh, the deeper periodontal pockets than your hand instruments. So you've got greater access to furcations and narrow pocket areas. So that looks like it's going to get down much easier than your curette, doesn't it? And there's lavage or irrigation, and that's what I love about the ultrasonic. There's a constant stream of water, okay, which is the coolant that exits near the point of that electronically powered tip. So this water stream within the periodontal pocket is termed fluid lavage. Lavage, water goes into the pocket and out of the pocket. So water irrigation of the pocket washes the toxic products and free floating bacteria from the pocket itself. And that water stream provides a better vision during instrumentation by removing blood from the treatment area. And for those of you that have gotten into hand instrumentation, if you've had somebody who's bleeding a lot, you can't even see where the tissue is sometimes, let alone where your instrument is supposed to be getting. So this lavage keeps the uh, water flowing and keeps the blood and debris away from the tooth surface. So the water lavage reaches the depth of the pocket. It goes beyond the tip just a little bit, and then it gets washed out. A bacterial cidal effect. Just the act of holding an activated ultrasonic tip in the periodontal pocket can be destructive to bacteria. So that's not to say that you're going in beep, 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 real fast. You, it's a slow and steady to allow that energy to reach all those areas. Think about trying to use a vacuum cleaner and you've got, um, you've got sawdust on the floor. You want that vacuum cleaner to go slowly to allow that sawdust to be sucked up into the vacuum. The same thing is going to be happening with your ultrasonic. You want to keep it moving, but you want to move it slowly. The action of the electronically powered tip is capable of disrupting bacterial cell walls and may also disrupt plaque biofilms slightly beyond the tip of the instrument. This is being debated with research, but right now they're thinking that there is action beyond the tip. Several studies have shown that instrumentation when you're incorporating powered uh, instruments, the, the time can be reduced when compared with hand instruments. So what are some of the limitations of powered instruments? Okay, those were all the good things. Right now, our main concern is aerosol production. Powered instruments generate high levels of contaminated 
aerosols. Everything that's in that pocket is coming out of that pocket and is being um, into the air, going into the air. So microorganisms in dental aerosols have been shown to survive for up to 24 hours. And it's not only the bacteria that's coming from the pocket, it's the bacteria that's coming from the instrument and the tubing itself. So that's one reason why it is so critical to, uh, we call it bleeding out. You rinse out your water lines, let it flow for a full two minutes before um, you start the day. You're getting all of that stagnant water out of there. That's why we are wanting you to do the eye wash stations as well. You don't want to be, if there's an, um, an emergency, you don't want to be sticking your eyes in water that has all sorts of bacteria in it because it's just been sitting there for weeks and weeks and weeks. So the eye wash stations are done on a daily basis as well. So it's so important to manage the aerosols. And that's why we have the PureVax, which are those special hoses. We also have, um, you could use just the regular high evacuation, the regular hose. We have long tips, HVE tips, as well as short tips that you can use. So it's whatever your preference is, but science is shown us that you need at least an eight millimeter lumen or hole or opening in order for it to capture aerosols. There's a very different thing from water management and aerosol management. Your saliva ejector is great for water management. Some of these other things that get put on your high evacuation um, is also water management. The leaf, there's mirrors that have little holes around them. That's water management, not aerosol management. The use of an antimicrobial mouth rinse before instrumentation can reduce bacterial counts in aerosols by about 92%. That's huge. Considering we are doing patient after patient in private practice, aerosol after aerosol, it's all becoming this bacterial aerosol soup up in the air that we can't see. It's another reason why I demand full PPE when you're in the sterilization area, especially when the ultrasonics are, um, are the ultrasonic baths are going, okay? It's a bacterial soup up in the air. That's why we're wearing hair bonnets now, okay? You're going home with all of this stuff landing on you. We want you to be protected. So mouth rinsing, if they can't mouth rinse, what else, what else is even more effective? We've touched on this before. The patient brushing. All right, they're them doing their OHE before they come in has been shown to be even more effective. So again, we're, you're not going to start your instrumentation before you do your disclosing. You take your plaque index, discuss the number with the patient, okay? And you do OHE. And OHE isn't just, okay, here showing them on one area of the mouth and then demonstrating back. You want them to be as biofilm free as possible. So you're advising them, let me see it over here. Let me see it over here. So essentially they're brushing their teeth. Cardiac pacemakers, we're talking about contraindications or some of the limitations. Patients with cardiac pacemakers should not be exposed to magno-restrictive ultrasonic devices. Magno-restrictive is what we have in the clinic. There's also piezo technology. Cardiac pacemakers, okay, um, have a box that's implanted underneath the patient's skin near their heart. Piezoelectric ultrasonic devices do not generate that magnetic field. So they don't interfere with functioning of the cardiac pacemaker. So 
If you had piezo technology, you don't need to worry about it. Magno restrictive, do you need to worry about it? So what uh, the old pacemakers did not have proper shielding. They, they have made pacemakers differently now. If you had a pacemaker, you weren't supposed to stand in front of a microwave. You had to be careful of certain things that you were around. Uh, now it doesn't matter, but if a patient comes in with a pacemaker, you want to get a clearance from the, um, from the doctor. Most patients will have a card that comes with the pacemaker that they keep in their wallet or something, and it has an 800 number on it. So you can call the manufacturer and see whether or not the magna restrictive is going to alter or interfere with the pacemaker at all. And for the last 15 years, they've all been shielded. The only thing that the manufacturers say is don't have the cord from the ultrasonic directly over the pacemaker. But you do need to follow up on that if your patient has a pacemaker. Reduce tactile sensitivity. You've got this insert that is thick. It's not hollow. Um, you've got vibrations and water coming out. Okay, you are going to lose tactile sensitivity. It's not an explorer. You can take your foot off the foot pedal and kind of use it, especially the thin certs, use it similar to an explorer, but you do lose tactile sensitivity. Limitations, infection control can be compromised because some electronically powered devices have components that can't be sterilized. Number of offices only have one handpiece and they disinfect the handpiece and you just put in your inserts. Those are the older ultrasonics. I've done it for years. But what's going inside the mouth is sterilized, but where your hand is, is not. It's disinfected. Very different thing. What are some of the contraindications for use? It's important to remember that electronically powered instruments are not recommended for all patients. So it's important that you review the medical dental history thoroughly. Who is contraindicated? Who do you not use powered instrumentation for? Somebody with communicable disease, all right? We are spreading aerosols all over the place. And you want to contain those aerosols. Communicable diseases could also be herpetic lesions, all right? Herpetic lesions on the patient. It can get into the patient's eyes. It can be transmitted in other areas to not only the patient, but you as well. So communicable diseases, high susceptibility to infection with the patient, individuals with high susceptibility to opportunistic infection that can be transmitted by contaminated dental water lines as well as aerosols. Contaminated water lines, Legionnaire's disease. All right, these dental unit water lines are really being looked at over the last 10 years and uh, everything, the law now states, OSHA states and CDC states that the water lines, the water coming out of them needs to be drinkable water. So we have to do testing on the water. Each unit in our clinic has a device underneath it. Uh, we do use county water. Um, so we have a device that's changed annually to disinfect the water. Other offices will use, even with the same units, they'll use bottled water. They'll put uh, distilled water in and they have bottled water and it bypasses the county. So even those need to have tablets put in them and units need to be shocked because the all of those hoses and tubes in the dental unit 
will collect biofilm. Dental unit water lines. So persons, persons with uncontrolled diabetes or organ transplants, debilitated individuals with chronic medical problems, and immunosuppressed individuals are all at a higher susceptibility to infection. I have a friend who's going through chemotherapy, as I said. She has to be very careful, okay? She had to get her teeth clean. She did. Uh, she went to her dental office prior to the start of chemo to make sure that she didn't have any uncontrolled infection. The same goes with I have uh, one of my classmates, even from dental hygiene school, just had a kidney transplant last month. She had to do the same thing. Pacemakers, we've talked about. Magna restrictive is, um, is the word that you want to be careful of with pacemakers and not the piezo. If there's an active lesion, wouldn't we reschedule? Yes, we are rescheduling anybody with a herpetic lesion. Anybody with a herpetic lesion that is presenting in the clinic will be dismissed, okay? Now, if it's crested over and it's healing, that's different. But we've also, the science has shown us that a herpetic lesion, by the time the lesion comes into a bloom, they've already been shedding the virus. So with herpes, especially um, on the, the lips and everything, there's this little prodomal um, aura. They get the tingling, they know that it's coming, and that is when that virus can be shed as well. So you want to pre-screen when you're calling to confirm your patients, not only are you asking them to show up on time and what the routine is of the clinic, what medications they're on, so you can have the drug cards already out and made, but you want to ask them if they have any sores or ulcers in their mouth. Patients who have difficult swallowing or are prone to gagging are not the best patients to use an ultrasonic on. Multiple sclerosis, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. These are things you're going to be learning in uh, pathology, muscular dystrophy, Parkinson's or paralysis. May ex These patients may experience difficulty in swallowing or be prone to gagging, especially if that fluid is pooling in the back of the throat. Patients who are really obese and have these thick necks um, that have problems breathing and need to breathe through their mouth. If they're a mouth breather, regardless of their size, it's going to be very difficult to use an ultrasonic on with water. Patients age, primary, Newly erupted teeth of young children have those large pulp chambers that are more susceptible to damage from the vibration and the heat that's being produced by the ultrasonic. Have I used ultrasonics on children? Yes, I have, but it's a pick and choose basis. I had one special needs child who couldn't tolerate hand instrumentation. So I had to use the ultrasonic. For some reason, they could tolerate the ultrasonic. And I had two assistants helping me, one to hold the head and another one to suction. It, was, it's, it gets quite complicated and um, small operatories can get very full. So it's a very specific thing and you have to be careful, make sure that you've got a lot of water and you're using a low power. What are some of the oral contraindications? You want to avoid that tip on hypersensitive teeth. That vibration, the vibration is going to hurt the patient and the heat is going to hurt the patient. Porcelain crowns, composite resin restorations, you're going to scratch. You'll leave a metal scratch mark behind. Demineralized enamel surfaces, you can puncture a hole in a tooth. All right, um, the underlying structure is, has a hole in it, but the top structure still has this little thin area, kind of like ice on a lake. 
right? But if you put that ultrasonic on there, you're going to poke that through. Exposed dentinal surfaces, that vibration is going to go directly through those dentinal tubules and the patient will be up on the ceiling. You'll have to peel them down. Ultrasonics are not used on titanium implants unless the working end of the power instrument is covered with a specially designed plastic sleeve. This is under debate as long as you don't have threads exposed. Some offices are saying that you can use the ultrasonic metal probes and regular hand instruments just as you would around a regular crown. But again, you need to know if there's any of those implant threads. So let's take a look at the types of power devices. There's two types. You've got sonic and ultrasonic. And of that ultrasonic, you've got magno-restrictive and piezo ultrasonic devices. Now, um, the sonic is what we're going to look at first. This attaches to um, your hoses in the dental unit. It uses compressed air. It makes an obnoxious sound. It is not ultrasonic, it is a sonic. Usually you don't have a whole lot of tips. This was, this has been around for a long, long time. You've got your ultrasonic units. They uh, sometimes will have uh, a Profijet attached for the baking soda, sometimes not but ultrasonics have their own electric generator and are not connected to the dental unit itself. So this is a separate unit. And what you have in the units at school, you've got your handpiece here that gets placed on the unit, okay? And this is what produces the vibrations is your handpiece. And then you've got your inserts. So let's take a look at your sonic devices. You can see that you've got a wrench here that you have tips, and then you've got your handpiece. Various tips. They're all pretty thick. Sonic does not need water. And um, it just literally fractures the calculus and it makes horrible, horrible noise versus ultrasonic is broken up into piezoelectric and magno restrictive. Now, most of the world uses piezoelectric or piezos. We in America use magno because we're, that's what we use and we get used to what we use. So let's take a look at the piezoelectric. Okay. This is a Parkell unit. That's a, um, a name brand. I've used Parkell in uh, my former offices. I love it because it was less expensive and um, it's small, but they are composed of portable electric electronic generators. So it's usually you need some sort of a hand uh, generator, a handpiece and instrument tips. There's a ceramic rod in the handpiece. So piezoelectric uses a ceramic rod. You have tips that are replaceable, okay? And depending on the area that you're trying to instrument, you place the tip. And there's a whole variety of tips. And there's usually some sort of a wrench that's needed for that. This is one of those slim diameters they come in all sorts of different shapes. All of them have a water filter. So if you look around your unit at school, you're going to see this little thing here, right? And this will collect dark gunky stuff and needs to be replaced periodically. Now, this is something that Mariella, because she's our lab manager, does for us. Quick connect, control knobs. Again, you want to be sure you're using enough water 
because water is the coolant. Power. And a foot pedal. Some foot pedals like what we have are incorporated into the rheostat, so you don't have a separate foot pedal. But if you have a separate unit alone, you've got your rheostat for um, your polisher and hand pieces, and you've got yet another foot pedal. So I learned to be, I'm a right-handed clinician. When I was in school, we learned to be a left foot pedal person because the patient would be coming in on, um, on our right side, we'd be sitting on the right side, we could kick, kick those foot pedals underneath um, on the other side of the chair. And um, that's where our left foot is. So I don't use my right foot unless I'm standing. Magna restrictive devices are composed, <coughs> excuse me, of an electronic generator, a handpiece, and instrument tips, just like the piezo. Magna restrictive devices have removable instrument inserts. Okay, and these are inserts, not tips that fit into the handpiece. And they have longitudinal metal strips. This my friends, is what you have to protect with your life. That's why your ultrasonic inserts have their own cassette. Once these stacks get bent, it loses its efficacy. And I have seen many event snack stacks over the years, and I've tried to straighten them, and it just doesn't work as well. But you've got your metal stack, you've got your O-ring, You've got your water outlet, which is here. Sometimes the older ones will have, and you can still purchase them, separate water outlets. The grip, which is now um, made out of silicone, a lot of them, and your working end. Companies are labeling these. So if you have a problem, uh, they what Hugh Freedy as well, When did you all lose me? When we were talking about how important it is to um, take care of the ultrasonic insert. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I didn't know I was lost until everybody kind of came up again. Okay, so it uh, it is important to take care of the inserts. Um, these metal stacks need to be protected. They need to be remain as the manufacturer intended them to be? Don't, yes? Don't see the uh, PowerPoint. You don't see the PowerPoint. Okay. I guess when it kicked me out, it kicked me out. Now, can you see the, st the insert? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, I'm sorry. Um, What students create with these cassettes is their own way of putting these into their cassettes. You have those little, um, you've got two ends of your cassette. You have one that's called where the grass is and those are all those little purple fingers. And then you've got another one, the other 
has little holes, okay, rubber things with holes on each end of it. Some reason students get the idea that they have to place this whole thing in one hole and then feed it through the other. That is not how it goes. These inserts get placed on top of the grass. And then these squishy things, when you close the cassette, keep everything in place. So you don't feed them through anything, okay? They go right on top of the grass and it will protect your ultrasonic insert. This O-ring, when you're having issues with the um, ultrasonic, um, oftentimes it's an O-ring. Mariella has um, O-rings. So if it's leaking or doing other things weird, see Mariella. We have all sorts of different insert and tip designs. It, they're making more all the time, all the time. So you can reach almost everywhere. And we want you to be comfortable with the right and the left and, and the, the triple bend. We want you to be comfortable with all of them by the time you graduate so you know how to use them and you can get full access to whatever the patient is um, presenting with you. But ultrasonics have controls. They're either built into the um, the unit itself as far as the chair or you've got a separate unit. Some allow you to adjust the frequency. And those are ones that have a tuning. Um, device to it. Parkell is one that has separate tuning because there are techniques that are used where you want to adjust that tuning. Studies are showing that you can do root planing, root debridement as effectively using just power instruments than you can with power instruments and hand instrumentation, but it requires that tuning. How efficiently an electronically powered instrument removes calculus deposit is determined by the vibration frequency, the stroke length, and the surface of the instrument tip that's in contact with the tooth. The tip needs to be in contact. Now, remember we were talking about the power of the tip kind of extends a little bit beyond the tip, but that is for the lavage and water flushing. So let's take a look at frequency vibration. Electronically powered devices use an electric current to produce rapid vibrations of the instrument tip. So frequency refers to how many times the instrument tip vibrates per second, per second. So you want to think about the instrument tip can be compared to the settings of a windshield wiper in your car. Are you on intermittent? Are you on low? Or are you on high? So the frequency is the speed. When the wiper setting is on low, the wipers go back and forth very slowly. So a low power equals fewer vibrations per second. Now with the devices that we have, you have a percent on the pad, on the screen pad. All right, so a low percent, 25% is going to be a low frequency versus a 95% is going to be a very rapid frequency per second. When the wiper setting is high, it's going to go back and forth much faster. High equals more vibrations per second. What do you think would produce more heat, low or high? The high would produce more heat. What do you need more water with? The high. Frequency adjustment may be either manual 
or automatic. If the frequency is set automatically, the condition cannot control the frequency. Okay, so I, and I lied. Okay, frequency is the tuning. Frequency is the tuning. Then the stroke refers to how far the instrument tip moves during one cycle. Another term for the stroke is amplitude. Stroke or amplitude. You've got a power knob used to change the length of the stroke. That is your percent. The lower the power delivers a shorter, less forceful stroke. The higher power delivers a longer, more forceful stroke. Think about a parent pushing a swing. Low power versus high power. How far is that swing going? Most units have a high, medium, and low power. You've got the percentage. Research investigations found no difference in the effectiveness of the high and medium power. So we really don't need to put our machine on high. Medium, 75% is about as high as we are ever gonna go. The use of high power is not recommended, especially with piezoelectric technology. So you need to know the insert and what it's made for. Are you using the blue triple bend you can put on a higher power? versus the slim green universal is meant for a low power because it's thin. Ultrasonic instruments must be cooled to prevent overheating. Sonic tips don't overheat, so they don't require any water. That's just using the, um, the air compressor. However, the use of water is recommended with sonic instruments to help lavage underneath the pocket. Tap water is the most common fluid used. Fluids like distilled water, sterile saline, stannous fluoride, and other antimicrobials are also commonly used with ultrasonic instruments. I would use distilled water or um, water first and then as my irrigant, I would go in, I'd do my debridement, and then as my irrigant, uh, instead of getting a, another syringe or something out, I would have either stannous fluoride or iodine I've used as well. Now they're using um, ozone and other things underneath pockets. Most ultrasonic units have water control knobs. Do you need a lot of water or a little water? And what is the water control knob on your units at school? Where is it located? Isn't it on the seat? It, it, it's on the handpiece, yes. It's that little blue thing. It's a turn knob on the handpiece. So the water would be adjusted uh, would be adjusted here that the handpiece goes in. Okay, then you insert your handpiece and then with after that you insert your insert. One of the most common mistakes made by clinicians is using too little water. So if your handpiece is warming up that means you don't have enough water flowing through it. If your handpiece is warming up, you might also, even though you have a, um, a lot of water coming out, there might be an air bubble in there. So you can't have too much water. Can you drown the patient? Absolutely, but you can't have too much water. Too little water may result in damage to the tooth pulp because of the heat. 
you want to have a couple drops coming off, big drops. And then this is what you're looking for, that spray. Now this particular insert has an external water line, which I used to like a lot because if you were doing, say, the mandibular anterior or maxillary anterior linguals, you could move this off kilter just a little bit. And what you do is you'd get your water going into the pocket, but you wouldn't have the spray. So it just made things a little more usable if you were working by yourself. You have your water coming out of here but they still make these. You have an internal flow tube. So when you have an external, the water's going to come out of here and, and the vibration, all of this vibration is going to create that spray. You want to see that fine mist. Do you mind if we keep on going, guys? No. OK, good. How do I decide which tip? You have five inserts in your kits. You need to decide what are you going to do with it? Are you going to be removing heavy calculus or light calculus? Is it above the gingival margin? Is it below the gingival margin? Is it in the sulcus or, or is there a deep pocket? So the larger the diameter, the heavier the calculus it will remove. So your triple bend is good for heavy deposits, mostly super gingival. That's your triple bend. Then they have these slim diameters. It's about 40% smaller. They did not have these when I was in school. They had these big bulky tips. And so uh, when we were doing things, learning about the Holbrook technique, which is the periodontal debridement with the ultrasonics, we were going into the lab on our lunch hours and we were making our own thin certs. We were honing these down altering the tips. Then the company started going, oh, we can be making those and they do. So now everybody's got them, but they have a longer shank length so you can get into the uh, deeper pockets and it's made for light deposits and deplacking as well as subgingival use. It's not made for heavy deposit. These things will actually break off and the more you use them, especially on the tooth surface, these get worn down. The tip gets worn down. This is called a beaver tail. We do have some of these in clinic, but look at this. This has got a nice broad surface. It's great for super gingival calculus. Now I've used beaver tail um, a lot in previous years, but I, it's more of a nuisance to um, sometimes use. So I save that for if somebody's got a lot of tenacious stain on their teeth, it's really wonderful for getting off. Large sized calculus ledges. Look how thick that insert is. Oh boy, would that take heavy calculus off. Then you've got your standard triple bend made for super gingival calculus. It's made for small to large size deposits. Can you get subgingively with this? Yes. Can you access interproximal surfaces? Yes. It's kind of a medium tip. It does not do fine scaling for you. You have your standard size universal tip. So this one would be your blue, whoops, your blue. And then you've got a green for subgingival deposits near the gingival margin. But this is still pretty thick here. So it's not made for deep pockets. 
You can get slim diameter straight tips, extended shank de designed longer. We're talking perio tips here. This is your purple tip. It's great for the anterior root surfaces. It's great for interproximal, especially the mandibular anterior interproximal. Then you've got your right and lefts extended shanks. These are for four millimeters or more. So if you've got somebody with posterior pocketing, you need to use the left and the right. These are different color coded. What I don't do, I'm code, this is the right, this is the left. I don't look at them that way to say, okay, you know, blah, blah, blah. I, I put one in and see where it's supposed to go. Because if it looks like it's going to work as a neighbor's probe, then you've got the wrong end. So if you do not have a four millimeter or larger pocket, then you can use the universal and you don't have to use the right and left? Correct. Well, if they have root surfaces that are exposed too. Now, if they have recession, you should be working on the right or the left because what's going against the root surface is this area here. Okay. Instead of the point, because you can gouge the root surface with that point, okay. the tip. Look at these, some of these have balls on them. These are great for furcations, great for furcations. I've only seen these in the perio offices that I've worked at. My general practice offices never had these. Let's talk about power setting. What's the percentage, okay? You want to know what the size of the calculus is and what type of tip are you using? Those slim line tips, the real thin ones, the left and the right and the green are not made for high power. You wanna keep them on a 25% under 50%. Made for sm small pieces of calculus deposit. Look at this, nothing is above a medium. So our cutoff point for everything is a 75%. A lot of this is using these correctly. So we know that the tip vibrates and um, that's responsible for removing the calculus. So the portion of the tip that's capable of doing its work is called the active tip area, active tip area. Now for our hand instruments, all right, that is our cutting edge, that lower tip third or toe third on powered instruments, it's the vibration of the active tip area that removes the calculus. Tip third. About two to four millimeters of the tip. Now that's what's removing the calculus. That vibration though is 360 degrees, so it goes all the way around for the magna restrictive. But the two to four millimeters at the tip is where most of the power comes from. Nothing lasts forever. These tips do wear. That's why we don't allow you to purchase ultrasonic inserts from previous students. Well, I only use them in school. Well, they're still not new. Instrument tips are worn down. As the tip wears, the effectiveness for calculus removal decreases. So one millimeter of tip wear results in approximately 25% loss in calculus removal ability. 50% loss occurs when two millimeters is worn down. And this is something that is really hard for employers to realize because these tips are about $125 
or more an insert and you're going going i need a whole new set and they're going but i just got you some a year ago well they're if you're using them all the time they're going to get worn down so there's something called a wear guide this one is from Hugh Freedy, and you put the you put the instrument on here, and then you can check to see if it's a one millimeter or two millimeter decrease. Again, one millimeter is twenty five percent, two millimeters is fifty percent. You're wasting your time. So they do wear. Two millimeters of wear results in fifty percent efficiency loss. And I've seen, especially when I've been temping, I've seen some nubs. I've seen some really nubs that look like they're worn down to about here. And it's like, well, what am I supposed to do with that? Powered instrument tips, disperse energy vibrations from each surface of the working end. So you have your face, your back, your point, and your lateral surfaces, just as you would with your manual instruments. The most powerful is the point of the tip. You're not using the point of the tip on the tooth surface. The lateral surfaces, okay, look how high this is too, is the least powerful, but you do have power going all the way around 360 with your Magno Restrictive. But most of the power is right there, two to four millimeters. The point of the tip should not be adapted against the tooth surface. It could damage the tooth. Now, do we use this point? Yes, we do. If there's a huge ledge of calculus on the mandibular anterior, for example, we're using that tip. It depends on what, what we're after, but we're not using it on the tooth. We're using it to try and fracture the calculus off. So again, it depends on what you're doing. You want to use the lateral side tip against the tooth. The face of the tip, again, you want to be careful. Lateral surfaces has the least amount of energy, but guess what? It's easy to use a lateral surface with the instrument, so you're using it. We have the ability to have our units put into our ultrasonic, into our chairs, so we don't have to worry about a separate unit and hooking it up. Most offices will have, even if you have a separate unit, it's hooked up all the time and you're not having to use it uh, and cart it room to room. When I was a student, we had to check out our ultrasonics and it was on a cart and we had to hook it all up just like your ProfiJet. Um, and oh boy, was that a pain in the neck. So depending on your unit now, how long do you flush this for? <coughs> Excuse me, minimum of two minutes. Prior to placing the instrument insert into the handpiece, you fill the handpiece with water. This is to make sure that you do not have air bubbles. If there's air bubbles in here, it's not going to cool effectively. So you want to fill this up and have the water coming out whenever you change the insert. It expels the bubbles. <coughs> air bubbles can cause the handpiece to overheat. You want to lubricate this O-ring. So some will, as the water's coming out of here, they'll just place the O-ring there, get it wet before they insert, and that's the, the best practice. 
lubricate the O-ring. Insert it all the way down until it snaps into place. <coughs> Never grasp or push against the working end when seating the insert into the handpiece. It should really slip in there pretty easily because you don't want to bend those stacks. Your water adjustment happens to be blue. Check the spray for a fine mist. And then for cord management, there's, there's a couple different things you can do for cord management. One is wrapping it around your wrist this way, because what's going to happen is you're going to get pressure and the weight is going to be this way. And eventually it's going to fatigue you. This is another way to handle it. Which way works for you? It's going to take some um, practice to figure out what you want. There's also something called cord ease, and I don't have a picture of it here, but it's something that you wear on your wrist. And it's made out of silicone. They're autoclavable now. And what you can do is you clip this onto here so you don't have to do it like this. Okay, you wear it on your wrist and it's autoclavable. Some manufacturers often um, offer tips or cords that are free turning, they have swivels. Let's take a look at strokes, sweeping strokes or tapping strokes. What do you want to use? When the instrument tip is adapted to the tooth surface, it should be kept moving at all times. Remember that vibration is creating heat. That heat is being transmitted to the tooth. So the sweeping vibration motion against the tooth surface is what you're looking for. And it's a combination of vertical, oblique and horizontal strokes, just like your hand instruments. But you're using slow movement and you're trying to cover the entire surface of the sulcus or pocket area. Calculus deposits, you wanna tap against. All right, so because of how this instrument is placed, they're using the lateral surface. That lateral surface is not the most powerful of the tip, but you're using the instrument so it's not harming the root surface. Calculus removal with the curette. This is a hand instrument. This is the difference here, my friends. For the curette with your hand instruments, you are going to the base of the uh, calculus with a closed angle. You are opening up that angle into a working end. You're trying to snap that calculus off from the base up, the apical area of the calculus, going to the bottom up. But with the power instruments, you're starting from the top and going down and that pounding is breaking up the calculus and then the water hopefully is bringing that calculus out of the pocket area. So unlike your hand instruments where you're going to the base of the pocket and trying to bring it up, the power instruments you're going from the top down. The tip itself is not touching the tooth All right, again, that is wrong. What is the correct angulation of that lateral surface to the tooth? Do you remember it was on the skilly valve? Zero to 15 degrees. 
you want to keep a closed angle. This is using the back. You're starting at the top. For heavy calculus, you are tapping the calculus using sweeping motions to deplaque and remove light deposits. Did you all have an opportunity to use the crayon? Yes. Okay. Light, light pressure. Let the machine do its work. If you are putting pressure on the calculus, then what you're doing is you are making, you're slowing down those vibrations. Versus... All right, this is going to be breaking up the calculus. Rrr, is not. The most common mistakes when using a sonic or ultrasonic instrument is the use of a heavy or moderate pressure against the tooth or calculus deposit. You've got this big piece of calculus, you think you need to use a lot of pressure, which you would lateral pressure for hand instrumentation, but let the machine do the work for you. Moderate or firm pressure decreases the effectiveness. Firm pressure will stop the tip from vibrating. So you want to lighten your touch. You want to lighten your grasp. Okay, light, light, grasp, light, touch. Let the machine break up that calculus for you. So you've got inserts of all sorts of different types of uh, diameters. The larger the diameter, the more calculus it is designed to remove. The slim lines are what we used to go into the, um, the lab to change into slim lines, but it's 40% smaller, just like your mini curettes. It's made for lighter deposits, but you can get into tighter areas, deeper pockets. You've got your straight tip. You've got a green straight tip. It's a slim line. You've got your left and rights. Again, what you don't want to use is this part next to the tooth. So, you need to make sure you're using the proper working end. Furcation. Straight tips work well for anterior uh, roots. They work well on root trunks of the posterior teeth, but they're not designed to get everywhere. Most hygienists will use a universal everywhere. And you know what, for maybe a perio two, uh, you know, they don't have any, any real bone loss to speak of. It's just initial perio. That might be wor working well for them, but you're not able to get everywhere. The straight tips do not adapt well to the curved surfaces found on the roots of posterior teeth. But it, they're great for anterior teeth, no matter how deep the pocket is. you need um, to have a shallow sulcus or pocket depth to use the straight tip in the posterior area. So we've got our curved curettes. These are your left and rights. Look at this, it's using the back and look how nicely it's shaped here. Okay, it's just going over here. There's no way this tip is going to gouge that root surface. 
So the back of the working end adapts. This one has the ball on it <clears throat> for furcations and root trunks. There are different strokes that you can use just as with your hand instruments, oblique, vertical, horizontal, When we're rocking on our fulcrum, we're naturally doing an oblique stroke. So your straight tips are great for anterior teeth and shallow sulci or pockets. Your curved tips are more like your area specifics. Oblique strokes are nice for deposits above or slightly below the gingival margin versus vertical strokes will reach deeper. It just looks like it fits, doesn't it? You want to keep a small angle of the tip third to the tooth, 15 degrees. And we will help you with this. Now, this is a particular type of dot that has the clear gingiva and you can see the deposit underneath the gum tissue here, which is really great. Um, on your boards, you will be having hopefully a mannequin that will have pink gingiva and white calculus. Last year, they had black calculus like this. So the um, applicants could see where the calculus was. And they said, hmm, this might not be a good thing. So they made the calculus white for you all and for this year's class. But again, you want to make sure that that side tip is adapted to the root surface. Vertical positions, great for the facial and lingual surfaces, straight up and down. The universal or straight tip is used for four millimeters or less apical to the CEJ. Four millimeters or less and anterior. You can use oblique or vertical strokes. Then we have our curved tips. And this is something that takes a little while to get used to, oblique versus vertical. Same techniques. You can see how this is curving and getting interproximally very nicely for super gingival. Very nicely. It just fits. Vertical, it's using the back. If you were using the other, the other one, the left versus the right, that tip would be pointing right there and gouging the root surface. So you want to think about using the back on the facial and the lingual surfaces. Your left and your rights are um, used in furcation areas. Your, it's used on uh, four millimeters or more apical. You can deactivate that 
ultrasonic, which means you're taking your foot off the rheostat. So it's not making those vibrations and you can feel almost use it like an explorer, but it's not uh, and see where you're going. All right. So you're using that ultrasonic. You've done maybe five strokes or so. Then take your foot off the pedal and just feel to see if you're getting the deposit or have gotten the deposit so you don't instrument. These balls are great for vacations. You can't get an instrument, a, a hand instrument into that vacation. Can't get it. This is curved to go into the furcation. Where do I use the right tip? Where do I use the left tip? Ah, okay. They're used, uh, they're, they're called right and left. Yours are not color coded. Doesn't refer to the areas of the mouth. If the shank bends towards the left, that's the left tip. If the shank bends towards the right, it's the right tip. That's just for identification purposes. So similar to uh, think of this as your curette, if you can use it on the buckles of the posterior on one, um, say that one side, you can use it on the linguals to the other without having to flip it, okay? Like your universal curette. So you might see a, um, some students have a poster or a little piece of paper that has the left and right to help remind them Is it making sense? If you can use it on the buckle for one, you can use it on the lingual for the other. So when you are using your left and the rights, hopefully you are doing an entire quadrant at one time. So you do all the surfaces you can with one tip. So if that's on the buckle, you're using that one tip on the buckle and then you change it to the left to do all those surfaces on the lingual. If you're doing a whole arch or the whole mouth, you're using one tip for the maxillary right buckle, the maxillary left buckle, the mandibular left lingual, wait, no, maxillary buckle, maxillary right buckle, maxillary left lingual, mandibular left buckle, mandibular right lingual. Then you switch it. You are usually going to be only using one quadrant. All right, so you'll be using one side for the lingual, switching it, and then using the other insert. But this says you can do, so if you're doing the lingual, then you can also do the interproximal of the facial. Yes. Okay. Yeah, with the way it's curved, it's great. So what insert would you want to use for this particular area? It's an anterior heavy calculus. You wouldn't use your slimline. The beaver tail one? That would be great, yeah, for a beaver tail, but that's not usually in our arsenal. So you use your triple bend here. And what you would do is you'd start up on the top and start chipping away at it. With hand instruments, you'd be trying to lift it from the bottom up. But with ultrasonics, you start at the top. And then this would all come off in one big chunk. It's quite satisfying. You'd start at the top and work your way down. This would be good because it's super gingival. Uh, you could use your triple bend 
here and then switch to a slim line. Can you just imagine, this is so much fun to get your hands on. So you're looking at your perio. You've got gingival recession, so you know you've got a lot of root surfaces. You've got furcations. This is where you would be using your slim lines and your left and your rights. For the pocket depth. Okay, that's it. What, um, that was a lot of information, but it goes into a little more detail than the, uh, the textbook does. And that's all we have to talk about today. That completes chapter 39. Any questions? Can you, you, we can put the cassettes in the ultrasonic. Yes, you can, as long, because the cassettes protect the stacks. What you have to do though, is be careful and make sure that your instruments are dry before you put, put them in and bag them or, um, or wrap them. And that's the hard part, because if they're not dry, then, um, then you can get uh, rust and corrosion and other things going on. Some offices do not use the ultrasonic for the um, their ultrasonic inserts. However, it's safe, it's effective because they are protected in the cassette. When you, uh, what I'd like you to do also is occasionally take a look at your mouth mirror a lot of times I will see disclosing solution as well as uh, pumice left over from the polishing um, on a mouth mirror. When I go to do an EOIO, um, it's usually somebody who's done multiple patients, but keep an eye on that. Sometimes you have to take your explorer and just kind of go around the edge of the mirror. Now with mirrors, I do have replacement mirrors. Mariella has replacement mirrors. So if your mirror ends up getting scratched or broken, come see us, we have replacements for you. Any questions? I have a question, Misty. Uh, just to clarify, if we have a uh, probing and exploring skill evaluations before spring break, we okay, right? Exploring and probing, you need to get out of the way. Um, that will leave your EOIO uh, as one of them and try and get one more in. Ultrasonic uh, does not count because that was a demonstration only and Profijet does not count. No, oh, okay. So who do you have coming in this week and what can you do? If you're picking up a scaler, do a scaler if you're picking up a, a oh coronal polishing yes yeah, you did coronal polishing as well and we've never done that before but uh, you've had to do those on patients real patients so you guys have the easiest of anybody who's ever done it so anyway um Again, the whole purpose of meeting your clinic mentor this week is just to try and feel out um, how you're doing, what patients do you have coming in, how can we as the faculty help strategize getting the rest of those skill evaluations done, because you have a bunch of them. You have a bunch of them. This is one of the worst semesters for skill evaluations. It's horrible. But the good thing is, it's the last time you're ever going to have to do some of these. Yeah, so Alexis is saying it's horrible. Okay, fine. So if there aren't any more questions, we can, uh, we can abort. Hua, can I meet you before clinic this afternoon sometime? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, because today is my assistant day, so I will be in the clinic really early today. Oh, okay, because it's only going to take uh, whoever my mentees are, it's only going to take about hopefully 10 minutes, no longer, because I want to see what your plan is. 
Okay. So do I need to print the paper with me, the one that we yes. just okay. Yeah, right. bring your okay. paper. If you've done any more skill evaluations, you can um, um write those grades down. Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay, guys. Thank you very much. I will see you all later.